Okay. We are about ready to start our next session. Um, and uh, it's very, uh, you know, fitting that people should stop eating now because in the next session we'll hear about intermittent fasting, I think, uh, by the great Joe Takahashi. Please uh, take the stage. Thanks very much, Morton, and uh, thanks to Alex and Morton for inviting me. Uh, since I'm really new to the aging field, uh, but we're really excited about uh, the importance of circadian clocks uh, in the aging process. And so all of you know we live on this planet that has a 24-hour light-dark cycle, uh, and organisms have evolved clocks to anticipate that cycle. Now, why is that important? You can think of it as an energy cycle. Every day, plants... Uh, utilize the sunlight to uh, take advantage of energy. <clears throat> uh, but we as mammals also go through a metabolic energy cycle every day. You might not think about this, uh, but it has profound consequences on our physiology and metabolism. Uh, and about 25 years ago, uh, we and others discovered the molecular mechanism of the clock, which is a auto-regulatory feedback loop, the transcriptional level, uh, shown here on the right, um, uh, there, uh, in which there are two master transcription factors, clock and BMAL, that activate two sets of repressors, period and cryptochrome. These proteins cycle, uh, and that cycle takes about 24 hours to complete. Now, what we didn't know initially, but we now know today, 20 years later, is that these master transcription factors regulate thousands of genes in the genome. So in the mouse liver, um, more than 3,000 genes <coughs> are direct targets of clock BMAL. And every single metabolic pathway in the cell is under direct transcriptional control by clock and BMAL transcription. Uh, this is a study that we did about a, a decade ago uh, when <coughs> genomic techniques first allowed us to look at the occupancy of our transcription factors uh, throughout the genome. And what we, what we found is that each day there is a very striking transcriptional program in the mouse liver. Uh, beginning in the morning, in the middle of the day, the activators clock and BMAL bind DNA. They recruit co-activators such as P300 and CBP. Uh, then that leads to a burst of transcription. Uh, you can see RNA polymerase II occupancy. Uh, and then this is followed by a repression phase by the period and cryptochrome proteins uh, that turn off this transcription. They then turn over and degrade, and then the cycle starts over again. Uh, this happens not only at the transcription level, but it's also uh, seen at the chromatin level. Uh, and so uh, we see classic promoter marks such as uh, histone 3 lysine 4 trimethylation cycling every day across 5,000 or more genes in the mouse liver. Um, at one time of day, the mark is not there, and at another time of day, there's a very strong mark. So that classic histone mark for promoters is really dynamic. It's not there all the time. Now, <clears throat> one of the major targets discovered by the field was metabolism. And so the clock controls me metabolism. I don't have time to really uh, go into the details of that. But metabolic pathways also feed back and directly regulate molecular components of the clock. Uh, so a couple of those are shown here. SIRT1, the deacetylase, regulates uh, core factors BMAL and PER2. Uh, the nutrient-sensitive kinase AMPK phosphorylates the cryptochrome protein. So these are just a few examples of how uh, metabolism feeds back on that uh, core transcriptional loop. Uh, now, uh, because of this sort of intimate relationship between the clock and metabolism, uh, 
we and others have been interested in what effect or what are the functional roles of clocks in regulating metabolism. So here's a very simple but striking experiment done by my colleague back at Northwestern. We all know if you put a mouse on high fat diet, it'll become obese. But what Fred Turek did was to give access to that diet only for 12 hours, either in the day or the night. Okay? And what happened is the mice that ate at night did not become obese, but the ones that ate in the daytime became obese. They had the same activity level and they actually ate the same amount of high fat diet. So they're processing that diet in a completely different manner, day versus night. Um, and indeed, high fat diet in a typical DIO experiment, that effect is actually coming from daytime feeding of those mice um, in subsequent experiments. Now, this protection by eating at the right time has been now uh, examined by many different groups. Uh, Sachin Panda the Salk uh, has looked at many different kinds of overnutrition diets, high fat, high calories. And when he restricts that diet, in this case, to an eight hour window in the evening, the mice are protected from body weight gain. So you can see here um, the ad lib mice, of course, become obese, shown in pink. But if they're restricted to nocturnal uh, eating, shown in red, they don't gain weight as much. Um, and as I said, many different versions of this uh, have been uh, found, including by Sarah Mitchell uh, with Rafa uh, using uh, a, a version of a restricted diet. Uh, but why did we get interested in this? this question. Well, if you look at the classic longevity experiments uh, from Wisconsin, um, what we saw was that the standard protocol for feeding the mice was to feed them on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday mornings. Uh, and so for us, that's a little strange because mice uh, eat every, every day, not every other day. And as, all, you know, as I've already alluded to, they eat at night, not in the daytime. Um, and so there are a couple confounds in this feeding protocol. Uh, and so we, uh, a number of years ago, were able to uh, initiate a project to try to look at these factors. Um, what influence does feeding time have uh, on lifespan? Uh, eventually. Now to do this kind of experiment where we time restrict feeding, uh, you not only have to feed every day, you have to take off the food every day. So that's twice a day manipulation and you would do that seven days a week for the entire lifespan of the mouse. Um, and uh, it's a little hard to get your uh, lab people to do that experiment. <coughs> So our solution was to uh, automate the process. We went to, went to pelleted food. We already have an automated system uh, for recording circadian activity of uh, more than 2,000 cages. Uh, and so we built our own automated system for feeding and recording feeding uh, because the commercial solutions are, don't, well, they don't do everything we want, which is measurement, but they, also are way too expensive and too clunky. Um, and so now we have way over a thousand of these feeders, uh, which we need to do all of these uh, survival experiments. Okay, so how does this work? So we're using a big pellet, it's 300 milligrams. Um, and th this is showing what we call as an actogram. Uh, it's a raster plot of the continuous wheel running activity in black of a mouse on a light cycle, uh, in this case uh, 43 days long. And each red or pink dot there is when the mouse has taken one of these food pellets. And these ad lib mice eat about 14 pellets a day. Uh, you can see that they eat three quarters of their food at night, but they still snack 
in the daytime. They're eating 25% in the daytime. Um, when Vicky, who did this experiment, who's sitting in the back of the room here, um, put the mice on caloric restriction, as the mice become restricted, they begin eating the food as soon as it's available. Uh, and so what we found is once uh, after a week or two, they ate all of their food within about a two hour window. Uh, why is it two hours? It's because we have a 10 minute delay between each pellet. Uh, so the mice have to wait and eat the pellet before they get the next one. So it takes two hours before they can get their allotment for that day. But this happens whether you start in the beginning of the day or the beginning of the night, as you can see from these actograms. Okay? Now what this means is when you put a mouse on caloric restriction, you're not only reducing calories, you're severely reducing the feeding interval time. Uh, and as I already alluded to, uh, restricting feeding time has metabolic benefits. Uh, the other thing that happens is the mouse is voluntarily going into a very long fasting cycle, uh, almost 22 hours in these kinds of experiments. We know that fasting, of course, is beneficial metabolically and for lifespan. So what are the factors that are important? Uh, how do we disentangle calories, fasting, uh, and feeding time? Uh, and so we initiated uh, an experiment that looks like this. We have ad-lib mice. We have the two caloric restriction groups that you just saw where they eat in two hours, day or night. But to get around the binge feeding, we also had two more groups that spread the food out over 12 hours, day or night. And then we had a fifth group where the mice are fed continuously. They receive a pellet every 160 minutes for their entire life. Uh, because they're calorically restricted, these mice eat the food in exactly the pattern that we dole it out. Uh, because that's all the food they're getting, and they're hungry. Um, and so uh, they adhere to these schedules uh, very rigorously. Um, so these are um, actograms, in this case, for uh, three years for example mice in these six conditions, ad-lib versus the five calorically restricted groups. Um, and what you can see is their activity remains nocturnal. There's some disruption depending on the feeding pattern. And overlaid in red is the feeding pattern. Uh, and we see what we saw before. Ad-lib has this uh, typical uh, pattern. Uh, and then the calorically restricted group groups eat in the two hour interval for their entire lifespan. Uh, and then we have the spread groups here. Now, um, we saw a, you know, a gradual decrease in activity level. Uh, the food intake increased a little bit in the ad lib group. We did not actually increase the calorically restricted mice, so they actually became more restricted. They're about 40% calorically restricted here. Uh, and then this shows the body weight of the ad-libs and then the five calorically restricted groups. Uh, they all had the same body weight. There is no effect of feeding time on body weight. And so here's the bottom line. Um, in gray shows the ad-lib condition. They live just under a median lifespan of 800 days, which is pretty typical. Um, then Surprisingly, in purple is the spread continuously fed group. Even though they're 40% calorie restricted, they only live 10% longer. This was incredibly surprising to us. So the contribution of calories alone is perhaps you could say only 10%. The mice that eat in the daytime, but they have a fasting interval of either 22 hours or 10 hours, uh, 12 hours shown in yellow and orange, they live another 10% longer, 20% extension of lifespan. And then finally, the mice that eat at night, shown in green, um, 
those mice live 35% longer. Uh, and the only difference between the day and night fed is the phasing. There's no difference in pattern or, or anything, okay? So we're getting a three and a half fold benefit in lifespan extension by feeding the mice at the proper time phasing and with the fa fasting interval. Um, now, I guess I have to go fast now. Um, so to get an idea of what's going on, we looked at gene expression in the liver. This shows you just the uh, differential gene expression in the ad lib group. Uh, as the field knows, uh, there's a huge increase in inflammation. So we see 2,000 genes in inflammatory pathways go up. And then we see five or 600 genes that are in metabolic pathways go down. Okay. Um, and if we look at this effect, of caloric restriction, what we see is the longest lived groups, the ones that eat at night, have the most rescue by caloric restriction of this divergence in gene expression. So for example, the longest lived group only has 4% total change in gene expression as opposed to 18% in the ad lib group. Um, in the the various conditions, we can see different subsets of genes that are differentially rescued by the particular treatment group. And so you see that caloric restriction rescues the large majority of those genes, but then the fasting component adds another 150, and then circadian alignment has a, a number uh, about 68 genes. And if you look at IL-1 beta here in the lower uh, right, uh, you see um, this is a perfect example of a gene that's only rescued by nocturnal eating and caloric restriction. Okay, so what about circadian rhythms? So in ad lib mice, we see a decrease in amplitude of cycling genes between 6 and 19 months of age. I can go into why we chose those uh, ages later. Uh, but what one other interesting feature is that daytime feeding uh, can be severely disruptive in the pattern of gene, res gene uh, expression. So for example, if you look at FOXO3, IGF1, these genes actually cycle normally in mice. Uh, but daytime feeding completely disrupts that pattern uh, and importantly, in many of these genes, there's no change in level of gene expression, only a change in whether the gene is cycling or not cycling, okay? Um, so we think that that could be another component that's important. And so uh, with age, there is an overall decline in circadian gene expression. Uh, most of the classic longevity and aging pathways are actually under circadian control. So here's just a little uh, um, diagram showing different tissues and whether or not those uh, tissues show cycling of a number of pro-aging and anti-aging uh, type genes, okay? Whoops. Uh, and so um, what we would say is the circadian clock actually controls all of the hallmarks of aging. There's evidence uh, for circadian regulation of every single hallmark of aging. Some better than others, but you know. Uh, and, and so we think that one way to look at the system is the clock is actually modulating almost every pathway involved in aging and longevity. And our um, strategy now is to try to target the circadian system uh, as a nodal point that can influence a multitude of aging and longevity pathways. Uh, and what we're trying to do is to use interventions to rescue the clock in three different ways. One is behavioral by feeding time. Another is genetically by upregulating the master gene clock in mice, which 
should increase amplitude. And then the third is to uh, screen for small molecules that can actually enhance clock BML transcription. Uh, and then those, we hope, could become tool compounds and perhaps eventually uh, be used for discovery of compounds that we could test for lifespan extension. Uh, and so if you want to know more, uh, Vicki has poster 84 upstairs, hard to find. Um, <clears throat> but you should go talk to, to Vicki. Thank you. Amazing uh, presentation, Joe. I think we only have time for one question. Vera, down here. <laughs> okay, just a simple question. Uh, did you have a group with time restriction but no CR, or that's something you are planning to? Yeah, we, we did have two time-restricted groups that were fed in the day and the night, but our s study was underpowered to show significant lifespan extension. So that's why we didn't include them in the paper. We're redoing that study now uh, with much larger uh, numbers, so we have power to detect uh, a more subtle increase. We saw about an 8% ex mm -hmm. extension of lifespan. Um, so now we're testing just whether time restriction by itself uh, has any benefit for longevity. Yeah, that would be the most relevant for people. <laughs> right. All right, thank you so okay. much, Joe. That was really fantastic. Thanks.